Okay, we back in the South Bronx. Before we start, we have an honorable mention, Big E. Big E definitely had the Bronx hot in the late 2000s with his rap song Free All My Ninjas. Not ninjas, but you get the point. He did it to the child abuse beat that Jadakus used, produced by Swiss Beats. Not only that, but he had another track, the Jackson Avenue diss, which was super epic, but has been removed permanently from YouTube. Other hoods would take the track and diss their ops too, and some even started jacking Big E's flow. That was very instrumental in the Bronx at this time, and we wanted to mention that. Speaking of honorable mentions, might as well throw in 280's own Yappy in there too. Yappy had a song called Shoot Him. He was wilding on there, dissing crew such as Flybridge. One legendary line was, this is real rap, I'm a bring it back, grabbed him by his pele, shook it off his back. Quality was not really good on the song, but hey, it was a time. If you know, you know. Anyway, these guys were dissing their ops before Chicago Drill came, but none of that has to do with the story. Let's get into the story. Not too long ago, we talked about the Roger Key Organization, also known as the Lucci Organization, which operated around the Melrose and Jackson houses. Specifically, the 321 building. Today we will talk a little bit about what happened after that part of the timeline. We did a story on the OGs as well, so this is a side story of that, as well as a revamped version of the Melly Mel Bowler story. If you don't know who he is, we will tell you shortly, but let's do some background first. In the Jackson and Melrose houses along Cortland Avenue, there was a crew, GFC, which stands for God's Favorite Children. Around the timeline we are talking about, members such as Banco and Juntao were considered the big homies of GFC. Juntao was cool with another dude, Mighty, who was also from Cortland Avenue, but not from the projects. Mighty lived closer to another project, Mario Lopez Plaza. Mighty and other guys, such as Juther, Paparazzi Po, Tay, and Charlie Rock, had established the Young Gunners gang in the neighboring housing projects such as Patterson and Mott Haven. This was after the days when Skate Key was an attraction in the Bronx, and most people who had a name back then went there. Although Juntao was from the Kirtland projects, he was influential in the early stages of the YG lifestyle, helping to come up with a name. This was during the mid to late 2000s, and guys were catching charges, in and out of jail, not allowing them all to be on the street at one time as a collective. At some point, Maria Lopez Plaza, where Mighty hung out and the Cortland GFC guys, where Juntao hung out, would be feuding. Mighty was cool with some of the guys from Cortland, and since Juntao had influence there, the beef would be squashed. In fact, Juntao was repping GFC, and Mighty would propose the idea for Juntao to use his influence to turn Cortland YG. Juntao did so, and they formed YGFC, Young Gunners from Cortland, which was a play on their original name. The crews enjoyed a fruitful relationship for a time until they didn't. To find out more about what contributed to the split, watch the story of Tia and the other Cortland Avenue videos. T-Money was a member of the Mac Bowlers. In 2010, T-Money had been recruiting young men around the Melrose and Jackson houses to sell drugs. This crew would be called CAC, which stands for Cortland Avenue Crew. Many of these young guys were already members of GFC, such as Killa and Melly Mel Bowler. Before we go any further, let's talk a little bit more about these two, starting with Killa. Killa, as other young men, was raised in a dysfunctional family environment, devoid of any positive male role model. He didn't know his father, nor does he know anything about him. His mother has never spoken with Killa about his father. Consequently, Killa soon understood that he should never broach the topic with his mother. When he was five years old, his mother married a man, the only possible father figure Killa ever knew. Sadly, the man passed away five years later. Killa's mother single-handedly tried to keep a roof over the family's head, which included Killa and his four older brothers. Consistently, Killa's family was relegated to living in apartments, always too small to accommodate the entire family, or to temporarily crowding in with a relative, and for a period of time, Killa's family had lived in a homeless shelter. While his mother worked, struggling to help the family survive, Killa would grow up unsupervised for the most part, in a toxic environment of crime, drugs and violence. When he was 15 years old and living with his family in the Andrew Jackson houses, also known as Vietnam, Killa had been suddenly awakened and had looked on in horror as two or more men burst into his apartment and shot his mother's boyfriend, who had been staying with them at the time. 
The neighborhoods where Killa grew up presented to unsupervised boys like himself, the temptation and false security of the gang culture, with its easy money, bling and drugs, while at the same time drawing these boys into a world of violence and misguided allegiances and loyalty. Killa's older brother, Zachary, was also a known figure in the Andrew Jackson houses. Killa was close with an idolized Zachary, who perhaps fostered his younger brother's progression down the wrong path. Zachary is currently serving 20 years in prison for murder. Ironically, Killa, at a young age, had already suffered the loss of at least three very close friends, all of who were shot and killed on the very streets where these boys sought some sense of belonging and legitimacy. Perhaps most tragic of all are Killa's failed efforts and lost opportunities to escape the consequences of the environment he was born into. Since he was a young child, Killa excelled at basketball. That was one of the best memories of his childhood, even winning a regional championship. At one point, Killa was recruited by an exclusive prep school in Connecticut for a basketball scholarship and was in the process of getting his grades up so that he could attend, but his progress came to an abrupt halt when he was arrested and incarcerated for a gun possession charge. In the aftermath of the shooting incident in his apartment and after the violence that took the lives of his close friends on the streets where he hung out, it is not surprising that a young man might foolishly decide to carry a gun for protection on the neighborhood's violent streets. Now, let's talk about his partner in crime, Melly Mel Bowler. Melly Mel was born in 1992 at North Central Bronx Hospital. Shortly before his birth, his father was placed in a psychiatric facility. He was released from the facility shortly after Melly Mel's birth. He was diagnosed with a break from reality and paranoia delusions. The father, in the first seven years of Melly Mel's life, was also a victim of a shooting and a serious accident where he was struck by a van in a hit and run, causing brain damage. Although Melly Mel was well known in Cortland, he was actually from a smaller building next to the Morrisania Air Rights Apartments, also known as the Browns. That location is both in the shadow of Yankee Stadium, a few blocks to the west, and, even closer, the adjacent Melrose and Jackson houses, notoriously dangerous and crime-ridden large city housing. Even with this, Melly Mel had essentially three things going for him. For one he was bright. He scored well above the passing score of 2250 on his GED and on standardized achievement tests. Secondly, he liked playing basketball and as a pre-teen, traveled to the local Catholic school to play in an organized league. Thirdly, he has a mother who loves him. Still, she was incapable of protecting Melly Mel from the ravages of the street environment, where hopes for achievement and success were sadly non-existent. He, like Killa, lost three friends who were murdered on the streets during his pre-teen years. At 14, his grandfather, Willow, passed away. That loss was devastating. Willow was an accomplished musician and had performed in three movies. He played with a famous producer, creative director and musician, Johnny Pacheco. He was a role model for Melly Mel. Melly Mel also saw through this relationship a vision that life could be broader than his neighborhood and the crime that overwhelmed it. Instead, Melly Mel could not cope with this loss of this potential positive role model. Shortly after his grandfather's death, believed his life was futile. He turned to the street life and bonded with others like him who perceived themselves as outcasts. He got involved in criminal activity shortly after his grandfather's death. From his first incarceration when he was 14, he was in jail for all but less than a few months. From that time on, except for a few short snippets of time, Melly Mel had been institutionalized in juvenile or adult facilities. When he was released from prison at 18, he was prevented from returning to his mother's home because of his juvenile record. At least on paper, Melly Mel went to stay with his father, who had frankly never been able to overcome his mental health and physical problems, to be an appropriate role model for his son. So, the story with those two, as we stated, they both were recruited by T-Money to sell drugs, along with other young men. This would cause a turf war in the Jackson and Melrose houses between GFC and CAC. Skeet Box was older than Killa and Melly Mel and was a supervisor for T-Money. Killa would distribute marijuana and crack to some of the other young guys in the crew. Some of the notable guys from then, A.U., Hump, Capo, Tay, Juntao, Tosh, Akon, 12, 13, Walt, and Suki, a.k.a. D-Nice. There were others too, such as Dev. We are bringing up Dev now, but he had been in the mix. He was linked to Harlem, and he is also a part of our story from Jefferson Houses vs. Cash Money Boys. He had committed a shooting in that story. Before Melly Mel and Killa, Dev's name was buzzing in the Bronx. 
2010 and 2011 would be bloody in the Bronx, and as a result of the gang wars, a few people from Cortland would go down for murders, including some of the people we spoke about earlier. On July 27, 2010, a Bronx man was found shot to death in Melrose. Jason Coria, 29, was discovered with several gunshot wounds to his body on Cortland Avenue near East 153rd Street at about 9 p.m. Coria, who had several prior arrests, was pronounced dead at the scene. Police were searching for a motive and a suspect. Later, it turned out that T-Money was responsible for the murder, and Skeet Box aided him in it. The details as to how was unclear. But, four days later, another murder would take place. An ex-con was shot execution style in the courtyard of the Jackson houses. Carol Agaro, 25, was shot in the head and torso, and was found in a pool of blood just steps from the front door of his home. He died at Lincoln Hospital minutes after the 5.45 a.m. shooting. It was a Saturday. Agaro was convicted in 2008 for drug possession and trespassing, according to records. Investigators suspect he may have been dealing drugs from his East 158th Street apartment, according to sources. Later on, when the guys were indicted, Dev would testify that killer shot Agaro at T-Money's direction, due to T-Money's suspicion that Agaro was snitching with regards to activities. Dev described how he, Killa, and another guy, Walt, waited for Agaro near the Melrose Jackson House's basketball court, and how he and Killa both fired their guns at Agaro, hitting him repeatedly. He also testified that T-Money promised Killa and Dev $5,000 to kill Agaro. After learning that Dev said this, Killa pointed to evidence that Agaro was in fact murdered by Dev, possibly because of a personal problem Agaro was having with Walt. Parsons wasn't done yet though. He testified that on August 27, 2010, a month after the death of Agaro, there was another murder. He stated that he and Melly Mel shot and killed another guy named Delquin Alston. Dev was at a restaurant in the Bronx with T-Money and Melly Mel, when T-Money told Melly Mel that Alston was selling fake crack cocaine to CAC customers, and that Alston was rumored to be a law enforcement informant. T-Money asked Melly Mel and Dev to kill Alston, promising to pay them. On the night of the murder, Melly Mel, Dev, and Alston sat on a bench and talked near a Cortland Avenue apartment building. Dev asked Alston to go buy some rolling paper for marijuana. Dev and Melly Mel followed him as he walked to the store. On the way, Alston stopped to urinate against the wall of a building. When he turned back around, Melly Mel shot him in the head with a 40 caliber pistol that Dev had given to him. Either way it went, this information was not known until trial. In early September of 2010, T-Money was killed by an individual working for the rival 321 organization. Some parts of the timeline was covered in the Roger Key story. After T-Money's murder, Killa assumed a leadership role in CAC, providing crack cocaine to the street dealers, until he was arrested in January 2011. After Killa was arrested, Melly Mel took over some of the narcotics operations, supplying crack cocaine to members of CAC, as well as to its customers. From this point, the GFC crew had deviated more from the YGs. The OGs had been established due to the influence of guys like Juntao and Pumpkin. Pumpkin was also a beloved member of the OGs, but was locked up in jail during most of this timeline. They would link up with the 1090 Gs, which have their own story and was influenced by Charlie Rock because of fallout with the YGs. By mid-September 2011, Juntao would be charged in connection with murder. He didn't pull the trigger, but instead supplied another member, Su Ki, with a gun that he would use to kill Daniel Delgado. He would be charged and convicted of another murder, and this time, he in fact was alleged to have pulled the trigger. That person was a YG member from Webster. We covered that in this story here. Anyway, before the end of the month, in September 2011, Melly Mel would be indicted. Other guys, such as Killa, Dev, Akon, Tosh, 13, among others, were already locked up. Melly Mel contended that his First Amendment rights were violated when the district court permitted the government to present as evidence a rap video and images of his tattoos, some of which he had posted to his Facebook page. The district court admitted into evidence a video that was made in December 2011 in the Melrose Jackson houses and depicted Melly Mel and a number of GFC members. In the video, Melly Mel is seen rapping. YG to OG, somebody make somebody nose bleed, I superscript, shoot the Ruger, I superscript 1 Emma shooter. A trial, Pemberton served as a guide through the lyrics, testifying that the young gunner's crew was feuding with the OGs.
The video helped establish Meli Mel's Superscript 1's association with members of the Enterprise and his motive to participate in the charged conduct against members of the Young Gunners. As for Dev, although Dev was incarcerated at the time, he was relaying messages to a friend who would post them to Facebook for him and later began to post messages himself from a contraband cell phone. In one post, Dev stated, I'm not telling on nobody from Harlem, but I can give up some Bronx ninjas that got bodies and be home sooner than y'all hearing, laughing out loud. On September 12, 2012, before trial commenced, Melly Mel sent a subpoena to Facebook, seeking the contents of the Dev account. On September 20, 2012, Facebook moved to quash the subpoena on the grounds that the SCA does not allow private parties to obtain content from service providers and that the appropriate method for obtaining such content was to subpoena a user directly. However, Melly Mel and his side failed to subpoena Dev and the individual who created the account in Dev's name, the two direct potential sources for the contents of the account. As part of its case in chief, the government called 40 witnesses, including six cooperating witnesses. Five of the cooperating witnesses were former members of CAC who testified about the participation of Skeetbox, Killa, and Melly Mel in the narcotics trafficking and violence. For example, four witnesses testified that they had purchased marijuana from Killa, and two of them testified that they observed Killa receiving marijuana from T-Money. One of the cooperating witnesses testified that Killa supplied him, as well as other GFC members. Cooperating witnesses testified that Skeetbox sold drugs with other GFC members, and Dev testified that he was instructed by T-Money that if T-Money was not available to receive the proceeds of narcotic sales, Dev should deliver those proceeds to Skeetbox. In the end though, Killa, 22, and Melly Mel, also 22 at the time, were sentenced to life in prison without parole, while Skeetbox, 27, received 50 years. But this bout wraps it up for this one, and as always stay low and thanks for watching.